Hey. Good. What's going on, man? How you doing? I'm doing good. How are you today? Oh, man, great. Less than making progress, man. That's dope. And and you're not working out of the office, right? No. <laughs> nope. At home. At home currently. How is it over there, uh, out there in, uh, in L.A.? Is it? I know it's not as bad as here in New York, but... Yeah, you know, I mean, it's just really tough to tell, man. You know, there's still a lot of movement going on. People still living their lives. Obviously, you know, this is something that we all kind of take into consideration now, but um, it doesn't seem like it's slowing anything down much. You know, there's limitations to, you know, what you can do and where you can be and when you can be, but... Other than that, things are still moving, man. Earth is Earth is still spinning. Yeah, it's true. Um, yeah. Our, our side of the world, it seems like things are even more busy, right? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. Um, I, I was gonna just, you know, give like maybe like a minute or two, whatever, to see if uh, some other people jump on. But you know, yeah. pretty much, you know, we're gonna go through. This is Digi Talks, and I'm gonna be try. You know, we're gonna make a gallant effort to try and, and turn this into a weekly thing where we can speak with industry professionals on the way of the world in the digital world, you know? Um, and I guess we're about a decade, a little bit more plus on the, uh, you know, the, the fact that we moved from the physical side of things and now into the digital and how that translates, you know, mm -hmm. to this day. Which is pretty cool because you know there's a lot of I have so many different um, and I'm sure you do too just little anecdotes from the DSPs, and in this segment we're going to go over a little bit down the line just what the myths and the um, you know what what it's like is it a myth is it you know it's like some people like still hold on to some old practices does these yeah. things still work, and uh, it could be co quite qu uh, comical at times. Eh? Yeah, but um. So, yeah, so so overall, too, like, you know, I want to thank you because you are the first guest. This is the first one, and I'm hoping that it, uh, you know. Yep, my first IG live, too. So yeah, yeah, bro, let's go. Um, yeah. But, you know, DCM, formerly known as Deep Concepts Media, now we changed it to Digital Content Management, so it's more like the DCM group. And, uh, you know, it started, I, I started it by, you know, just the love and the passion for hip hop. And our first clients were, you know, who were my favorite rappers, right? So I went from the mortgage and real estate business, which I considered myself an expert in and had a, a 15 year career in that. And then when everything started to crash, I was, you know, in the real estate market 2009, 2010, mortgages, you know, my background is in mortgage construction, finance, real estate, that type of stuff. But I wanted to be a little bit more passionate about like what we did. You know, it wasn't just about like making money in a sense. So I, you know, I said, let me, you know, a friend of mine who is my partner, DJ Mickey Knox, who is my, you know, founder and partner with me, yep. uh, you know, it was like, listen, we're going for the, uh, you know, the guys that we always listen to. That was who we wanted to be our first clients. To me, my favorite rapper in the world then, now, and in the future is always going to be Nature from The Firm. My favorite rapper ever. So I said to Mickey, we have to, this. if I'm going to get into this business, I have to go after Nature. You know what I mean? At The Real Nature on IG, it's like my brother, and we're still working to, you know, to this day together. So it started off with the passion, with the want to empower, to help, to educate, um, because Guys like Nature, Ali Vegas, Tragedy, Mike DeLorean, Bars and Hooks, all these types of like legacy acts that came from a certain era that didn't transition into the digital era mm -hmm. the way they should have, you know, in that sense. Now, I didn't have the prior knowledge. So, you know, I only came into this game on the digital side. So, you know, my name is Menza. The company is DCM. And uh, I'm the founder and CEO. My partner is DJ Mickey Knox. And, you know, we, uh, we did it out of the love and the passion for the culture. I'd like to hear from you, Sid, and, and who you are and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. A Chicagoan from the city of Chicago. So, you know, house music, hip hop, you know, the whole culture was just kind of bred in me. Um, you know, I didn't grow up doing music. I was a... Uh, you know, before I got into music, I was a football player for 17 years. Wow. So I was, um, you know, streamlined to, you know, do 
uh, you know, I try to go the professional route. Um, but, you know, in college, I kind of just got into producing. Um, so this was maybe, you know, 20, 10, 12 years ago. Um, just started producing just, you know, kind of as a pastime or as a hobby. But, uh, you know, when I was 21, I'd ask for a piano for my mom. Um, because she, you know, she wanted to make sure I came home for Christmas because, you know, college, you know, you're a full ride scholarship guy. You're not going home during the, you know, the Christmas breaks or whatever. So she wanted to make sure I came home. So she asked me what I wanted. And uh, I said, you know what, let me get a piano. Just out of a joke. And she actually got me this piano. It's just a little Yamaha keyboard, man. It was, um, got it and turned it on and it was like I'd been playing forever. So uh, long story short, we fast forward to me starting my own record label. Uh, you know, started doing some some pretty dope collaborations, producing and whatnot. Um, and you know, at the time, I was based in South Dakota when I, uh, you know, really started to you know put my feet in the ground on the business side. Um, really starting to work and build, you know, Moamp Records, which was you know, which is my, you know my label and company. And um, you know, I needed an outlet for distribution, so I started doing you know research and. Of course, the, the, you know, the, uh, the Golden Goose LinkedIn, you know, went on there and had a chance to connect with, um, you, know, uh, you know, my friend and partner and, uh, you know, brother, uh, Andrew, uh, over at uh, Create. And he was like, you know, yeah, you know, we got a great distribution platform, a labeling. Um, you know, this would be perfect for, you know, you're an emerging, you know, label, you know, use our platform for distribution. So I drove 30 hours uh, out here to meet him and, you know, meet with, uh, you know, John and Alex and, uh, you know, founders of Create at the time. Um, you know, this was in 2016. And, um, you know, for a year and a half, I was just working you know, on Moab, really building that label, you know, cutting some great records, writing some great songs. Uh, but, you know, I knew my source uh, of information on how to really thrive in this industry was in L.A. Uh, so I'd reach, you know, reach back out to Andrew and you know, at the time Create Music Group was growing like wildfire, we still are. And uh, well, you know, I started working, uh, came right back out here from Chicago at the time and uh, started working with, you know, uh, the distribution team, uh, you know, at Create. And since then have, you know, evolved doing a and work. Um, I've been doing sync and licensing, um, you know, as far as, you know, clearing and, you know, doing one-stop type uh, catalog clearances and, trying to play songs and you yeah know, good you know, opportunities with that as well um yeah when we yeah. first met you had said that you, you, your your specialty or background was in sync synchronization and licensing well you know i think really what happened was i i got in you know for some reason i knew that and this was just me doing my own due diligence because mind you i wasn't in this industry i had to learn the business side of it but i just had gotten wind that you know and locked into a philosophy that the only three things that really truly paid in the industry were, you know, first you have to have great records. You have to have the content. You have to come with something that you believe in, that you feel comfortable expressing. Yep. And shows and touring. You know, obviously now that's a super suppressed part, but shows and touring is easy in like money, uh, in revenue, and then sync and licensing. I just sure. thought that, you know, aside from streaming and uh, even at the time, still a little bit physical sales. Yeah. You for that. So I just, I literally just got obsessed with it. I love movies. I love film. I love television. You know, do some writing and production for that as well. Some, but I just, you know, that mesh is the only world where music and, you know, visuals come together. So I just locked in on it. And um, fortunately, linked with a company um, and a partner that was getting into one stop really early um and nice. one is basically you know the ability for uh you know the person pitching the licensing agent to collect both master and publishing some gotcha of, of the uh you know of the composition and of the song which typically you got to go to several different places to get clearances so it was really early in the popularity of one stop that i got in okay this is great um but really my my specialty was really in production and then now is you know starting off at you know when i started off at cmg um you know uh you know distribution uh of course but um you know i just love music and so i you know i couldn't really say and i think you know some of my peers would say the same uh, specialty wise you know who knows because nice. i'm not dabbling a little bit of everything yeah no yeah. it's great when i first you know when we first started working with label engine and of course label engine is the technology 
that drives independent digital, I, I call them catalog labels, you know, mm -hmm. digital labels. And I noticed that the technology behind Label Engine was so much more sophisticated than most of like the layman's, uh, you know, operational tools, like, you know, no disrespect to any of them. There are a bunch of them out there and they work. But when I, when I stumbled across Label Engine, it was the most efficient one. Then to understand where the, the, the you know, the, the company that holds that technology and where they sit in the world of detection technology. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was I was very impressed. So at that point, you know, and of course you get to see the website and you see Future on there and, and Trip. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the thing is, is that I was I was impressed just by the way that it accounts for everything. Where you can track the playlist, you're able to connect to SoundCloud and YouTube. It's a lot mm -hmm. of tools that um, most of these places, you know, in a sense, it, you know, they, they have add-ons and this and that. This was a one-stop shop for everything I needed. And then to be able to have a rep like you, you know, who was just attentive and, you know, intuitive and was able to, like, handle, you know, troubleshooting on, on the spot. I'm like, listen, this is, you know, this is my home. And, of course, you know, the beginning of this year, I brought, you know, Naughty out there, Naughty by Nature. And I think that really solidified the relationship between DCM and, uh, and Create create music group, CMG. And, you know, again, here we are just having a conversation about digital, you know, the, the, the practices, what we should be doing, what we should not be doing. You know, you have a, a great background and, uh, you know, you're at a really prominent company that's growing, you know, growing like every month. I mean, it's yeah. ridiculous, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because I believe you've told me this before, but, you know, let's just, let's just clear it up. Like, are we or are we not the, the biggest, uh, I guess what it would be independent hip hop. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, man, that's dope. And take some yeah. pride in that for sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you, you, you guys are, uh, it's definitely been a pleasure, you know, getting to know you all and work here and, you know, try to take these things to the next level. And then, you know, I think one of the things you said uh, initially was just the educational part of it when you got started. You know, you, uh, you latch on to, you know, the, the acts that you're really fans of. But, um, you know, really helping them through the process is it, beneficial for not only them, but, you know, for us as well. You know, the, the teacher becomes the student, you know, the student is the teacher or whatever that, you know, saying is. Um, and it's, it's been, you know, it's been really great to, you know, continue to learn through some of these processes, like you said, troubleshooting. Because, you know, in the digital world, it's digital. It's not like physical. Yeah. You knew the product was you know, defected or, you know, messed up or, you know, if it didn't. Yeah first play you know it's like okay something wrong here um you know but here uh you know in the world we live in now which it happened so fast um metadata and attention to details and just continuing to want to learn uh it is is like the just the best uh you know kind of outlook and yeah you gotta about troubleshoot and work through things and and get to the experience of you know when they pop up again because like you're saying, and I understand where you're getting at in terms of in the digital world, there's no way of predicting how any of this stuff is going to go or what, what would go wrong. And I yeah. think that's a, a huge misconception amongst some of the traditional thinking record execs or just artists and producers that come from a certain time frame that mm -hmm. they feel that, well, if you go and you do this A, B, and C, you know, it should result to, to this because this is how... And, you know, again, this is where DCM's, um, you know, the tra uh, teaching the transition from that era into the new has been the biggest, brightest experience for us because I get to work with, with guys who are idols to me, you know, since, since a child. And, you know, being able to bring, again, clarity and, and education to, you know, people that I feel definitely deserve it and, and need it. You know, we have, again, just going down, I just like to go down a list real quick of some of the, the legacy artists that, do you know run their their digital content through dcm and through create music in that portal uh right now we just did like you said it's it's naughty by nature which slugger is there is kg and Vinny, and that's their ventures of uh you know putting out new artists new music like mm -hmm. nicole michelle you know and uh now we have ryan lane this month and they have a bunch they have fresh though they got a bunch of kg is really such an amazing um song creator and hit maker you know and i realized one thing with him in comparison to a lot of the the legacy acts that i deal with is that you know he is really only accustomed to making hits 
<laughs> yeah. He, he he doesn't know what like throwaway records on. I always like get on him about it. It's like, yo, it's okay. We could, but every song is a hit. Every song yeah. from KG that I've heard so far is a song that could be on the radio. So, you know, we are extremely proud of working with, with Slugger, uh, Naughty, KG, and Vin. You know, we have, I did a deal with the Ewing uh, athletics, you know, with the Ewing Apparel Company, the, the Hall of Fame, Patrick Ewing and his sneaker company, which is now owned by a, a gentleman named David, and he's a partner of ours. And we did the Ewing portfolio, which is under Create, as you know. Um, mm -hmm. Kooji Rap is one of the, uh, you know, the flagship, or the, the, the staples of that portfolio, and working with him, putting out new music and, and securing some of these old assets that, you know, were kind of floating around on YouTube. That yeah. was the, um, the, the, the main thing that DCM started with, finding lost royalties for these legacy artists and saying, you know, you realize that YouTube has this song streaming, you know, a million times and you've never seen anything from it. There's a way of, of uh, you know, gaining that, the, the, you know, the monetization on that, putting digital codes on it, tracking it and all that. So that's kind of like how the model started. And, you know, as we sit here, like I said, the, it goes on and on. I, was, I had the pleasure of working with Eric Sermon and Def Squad, and, you know, for almost two years and learning the business through them and, and with them, and then also being able to educate them on, you know, the digital power of, of this, you know, these, uh, again, finding the lost royalties and then putting out new music. We was a part of putting together Vernia and, uh, and helping push that through Def Squad. And that was Eric's album that came out last year, Soul Album, which was a, which a major success. And you guys helped out big time on that too. Um, we have PD Crack from State Property. We have yeah. Cassidy, which you know he got in his career has four number one singles. Yeah. We've we have Mr. Cheeks and the Lost Boys, of course. Like I said, Nature, Ali Vegas, track. Mm -hmm. Phone just stays ringing. I gotta like, <laughs> but uh, so you know, with all that being said, yeah, I feel like we've you know we've built such a portfolio amongst legacy artists. Yeah. Is that, you know, it, it helps me get in the conversation pretty much anywhere to say, you know, like I, I represent these guys digitally. Um, mm -hmm. Let's go over some, some, just some facts and some fiction, you know, some myths and stuff like that. I don't know if you have any in mind in particular, you know, but um, one of the myths, and I, I, I learned this by, by hard nose experience, where me mm -hmm. and Rockwilder went into Def Jam one day and sat down with uh, Paul Rosenberg and, we're in a meeting and we're we're basically pitching, you know, or presenting a you know a one song, one album, like 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 an accumulative project, basically, you know, and going yeah. over that. And you know, the response immediately was, you know, you you don't have three, four, or five projects coming after that type of thing. And it's not that we didn't or we couldn't have had, but that's not what our initial conversation was. And it taught me something immediately, which was these these assets are being packaged in bulk and in quantity right so the myth to me and i see this a lot in just emerging artists and again some of the older legacy artists that are like you know i have this amazing project and this is going to be the one where we're going to go it's and the truth of it is is that the attention span and the consumer attention span is so short that no matter how great it may be we still have to follow up every month with new material so you know if i had anything to say just off the off the jump in terms of digital labels emerging and emerging artists is as great as you may think your your last album or the album that you're working on is or the single that you're working on is if you don't have the longevity in releasing something every month maybe for the next two years chances are you're going to lose the attention span of even that even if it's an amazing song it's still, it's still going to fade off if you don't have something to follow up with. How, how do you feel about that in terms of myth or, or, or fiction? Uh, yeah. Fiction. yeah. Yeah. I think you know, in anything, consistency is key, you know, and like saying the, 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 the attention span, but like us, if we can personify pop culture, the attention span of pop culture is really short. Um, and the way to penetrate that is with consistency. And like, I think you said two years, 18 months to two years of just consistent releasing, especially if we're thinking on the emerging side of things, um, you know, really trying to break into, the, you know, getting fans that you didn't have, um, you know, before, and then retaining those fans. You just got to keep feeding them with content, uh, and you got to feed them with content 
you know, across all that. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest, you know, one of the biggest notions is that, you know, yeah, this great record is going to be the one for the artist, but, you know, again, it's like anyone can do it once. The great ones can do it again, which is why you say, like, with KG, he, he can do it again and again and again. And there's a lot of great talent and a lot of great artists out there. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the patience in, in wanting from the artistry side, you know, we want things to happen. You know, we want yeah. to get that. You know, They're impulsive. They want it to happen right away. Like, this record is, this record is great. We want new music Friday, yes. right? How can we it got, not go? This is the one. We got two songs on yeah. Spotify, and you're asking for new music Friday. And this is like, okay, well, you know, yeah, the song is great, but we have to build up your, pro, your profile in order to really be able to, you know, position you know, your music in a place to get those big placements um, and to start to really generate, uh, you know, authentic and, you know, retained, you know, fan and uh, fan engagement. So, yeah, you know, you take Russ, for example, he yeah. released for a year, two years almost, a single a month or something like that he did. I get it. I absolutely get it. Um, we can, we can go everywhere from Russ to, look, let's be honest, right? Lil Wayne is the first one who started that trend well, yeah. about 15 years ago, I would say. Yeah. Okay. And that was yeah. when mixtapes were huge. Yeah. It was just get on everything, drop everything, freestyle mm -hmm. to everything, collab with everybody, yeah. and just flood it with quantity, right? I yeah. think I think it worked. Obviously, it worked at the time because things were so everything was exploding with yeah. with the internet, right? Yep. Yeah. But when streaming came along, in in terms of it being a foundation to have these profiles and to and to be able to gain stats and, and track statistics and metrics. And then it almost became like a scientific, you, know, uh, you know, it was an equation that yeah. you just could look at the analytics and say, we know that this is going to move this way and that way. And then it became mm -hmm. science and then just data science and, and people studying trends and, you know, yeah. and here and again, now here we are at, at this point where a lot of artists that I, I try to really break down this this thing about testing. You know, this is what Nicole Michelle is, in a sense, going through right now, where we we have to identify the demographics and the geographics. And once you're able to start to identify them, you're not going to get them for maybe 60 days. And yeah. then you have to start to target towards that with some budget. And then you also have to start to figure out when can I start to go after the, the geographics that's not listening and how do I start to bring in the, the new discovery and again the, the monthly retention numbers is the most important numbers in all of the of the business yep. if you can carry that retention in from one month to the next yep. you would only be able to know if you dropped music every month yeah so again uh, you know this is the reason why singles work and nobody is you know dropping an album I mean yeah I get yeah. it, you know what I mean? But like, Dude, man, you know, we from the 90s, man, you know, hip hop, we love albums. I mean, I can't think of anything, you know, that I'd love to do more than just chill out and listen to, you know, Outkast, Equimini all the way through, you know what I mean? But, yes. um, you know, I think, you know, you made a good point with the, you know, how things started to really change with the mixtapes and, you know, what Lil Wayne did, um, yes. you know, in that era, with DJ drama and all of these different things, like it, it really set up it, it set up some great things for us, you know, in the digital world and in, in terms of breaking artists. But it also it, it also you know put a damper on some of the things as well. Um, you know, you 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 kind of see a and this is kind of a, a trend segue that's kind of happened over the past you know ten years. You kind of see that that methodology being mirrored in a very unplanned you know, way where you have, you know, hip hop artists, especially just dropping left and right. I mean, they can, you know, there's a, you know, we got a song coming out this Friday and, you know, you just got the song together today and it's when, yes. You know, so, you know, having that, that, uh, that quick gratification attitude yes. in of developing the content, packaging it, getting it to your distributor partner and then releasing it uh you know that mixtape error kind of put a damper in you know that whole process or, or it, it it created a veil you know yes. to where 
or a, a lot of hip hop artists think that this is the way to go. But even when, if you're exactly right, where where it, cre it created the fail created the the need for yeah. the remedy in that sense, and streaming just happened to be that remedy where. You know, it wasn't a matter of like people are downloading it for you know illegally. You're either going to get pirated, or let's come up with a system where they can still listen to it at their fingertips, but mm -hmm. you can get something for what you what the, when they are listening or viewing. And this is where we go into another myth, right? Here's, here's a great myth that you know the, the the money in the business was so much better way back when, or it was great to get paid you know, upfront or advances and all that type of stuff, right? And I get that. Again, I wasn't a part of that, that, that time frame. I don't know really yeah. much about it. What I do know is that when you sell something one time, mm -hmm. only one time, I sell an album was a physical CD. I made one sale. So yeah, maybe a million people bought it. Maybe off of a $10 purchase, I seen a dollar and I made a million dollars. Yeah. But yeah. if the same million people listened to it um, a, a thousand times a piece as opposed mm -hmm. to buying it once because if, if you buy it once you're going to listen into in your car a million times right i mean how many times have you listened to Red, ready to die by biggie or mm -hmm. illmatic or, or, I, I mean i've listened to them thousands of times so every time in the streaming world now the artist is continuously getting paid for the rest of their life if of course they're, they're owning you know their their, their their masters or their digital rights in that sense and that's where mm -hmm. You know, the myth behind, I've seen so many times, I've been, I've been in Facebook battles with, with people that have been in the business, people, producers, people that, have, that should know better. And it's like, yeah. streaming is the worst thing that ever happened to the business. We mm -hmm. don't make any money. Meanwhile, you have kids, like you just referenced, there's, there's kids that, you know, they make a song, they, 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 they put a light mix on it, mm -hmm. they upload it into their system. They already know they have a half a million followers or fans or, or listeners every month. And mm -hmm. by making a song in one night and uploading it that night, they just made themselves 10,000 or 15,000 or 20,000 because they know their listeners are going to listen. That's mm -hmm. where those monthly retention numbers become so important on, again, this like basically a scientific uh, equation to yeah, you look, you're looking at and saying, I know my retention is this. Yeah. I know my pull through is this. So my only goal is to keep adding to that consumer bank Right. You know, and, and, and then servicing them. So, again, a myth to me is that there's less money in the business that now than there, than there was then. And I, can, I believe that it's completely false. And I believe that there is still a market for some physicals. I think yeah. we still can sell some, you know, vinyls make a big comeback. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, tapes at this point have become more of, of a collector's item right. than anything. And I think some people still buy CDs. Listen. At this point, Sid, downloading is becoming it is, pretty yeah. historic. Okay, no, no longer. I mean, it's it's there on some platforms, but the ones where it was prominent, it's no longer. It, it's 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 hilarious to me. Even people that still want to download, like I know, you know, a handful of people. Like, look, Bandcamp is 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 a great tool for independent artists. Yeah, it definitely works. And those are for the 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 old school dudes that are on the computer, if that even yeah. makes sense. So yeah. and now, you know, but everything is on demand. And this is where the fact is that I want to, uh, I, I want to point out on the fact side is that, you know, everything is on demand, right? Yeah. We, yeah. we can order an Uber ride. I can have somebody at my house in two minutes. I can order yeah. food, no matter what it is, I can pretty much get what I want to consume on mm -hmm. demand, viewing, watching, <laughs> listening. So, with that being the case, and so many people being, you know, uh, I guess upset with cable TV and their cable companies and all these ones, they want to lump all these packages and I pay $200 a month for nothing and I only watch two channels and all that, yeah. stuff, right? Yeah. The fact is, is that, you know, we are moving towards a subscription-based culture, okay? Oh, yeah. For and, sure. and everything is going to be where if I want to yeah. listen to any song in the world, I only have to pay $10 a month. To Spotify, yeah. okay. Yeah. If I want to watch anything in the world, I can pay my Netflix thing and I, I go watch. So yeah. when we start to break down some of these micro products, okay, which you know maybe just genre based, lifestyle based, mm -hmm. and everything you see is even Disney, right? That's like that's yeah. It. yeah. You can pay to YouTube if you want to watch the NBA Finals when there is an NBA Finals. 
um, you know, you can watch it through YouTube through subscription. Yeah. So building a, a micro community, all right, of consumers that you can say, listen, this is my community that loves my product. Right. And if you give whatever it is worth it to you, look, we see platforms like Patreon, right? That, that you're able to build a subscriber base and say, I'm going to give you this product every month and you pay me a certain dollar amount. For anybody mm -hmm. who's watching and anybody that watches this once this is chopped up and put on YouTube or whatever, if you're not building subscribers, you are going to be the people that are still downloading in 10 years. Okay. <laughs> you're going to be like, well, where's all my streaming? And people are going to be like, yo, you don't, you don't know that it's, it's not just streaming anymore. You actually have your own subscribers. Yeah. So when we look at, you know, our Instagram profiles or, or our YouTube channels or yeah. Facebook friends or whatever, there is going and, and mark my words, I'm, I'm, I'm predicting it now and you can see it. So it's not like I'm some genius. It's just mm -hmm. when you watch another few years from now, bro, there's going to be people you've never heard of with micro communities of subscribers that are living a wonderful life off of just servicing super fans and consumers that are willing to keep oh, yeah. that brand alive. Oh yeah, that's that's one hundred percent already the case. Like you said, it's already happening. I mean, even on YouTube, you look at some of the like you said, the lifestyle channel. Um, you know, there are lifestyle channels where couples just do random couple stuff with twenty two million subscribers on this that channel. Unbelievable. You know, it's unbelievable. But again, you know, what those like you said, what those what those, you know, I guess in the sense of artistry, what those people do to, you know, put a stamp on their content is they deliver it consistently. Yes. You know, they're delivering something consistently to where, you know, you, we also have to, you know, personify the, 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 the digital world or these platforms. You know, for me, I take Apple Music, YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud. I personify these platforms when I'm thinking about them in terms of how I want to position a record. Yes. I want to know, you know, I, I need to know that for Apple coming from hardware based, you know, uh, you know, history that people who use Apple are more likely to curate their own playlist in a sense, because Apple is typically where you would go download and, you know, upload your hundred CDs and then now they're all on iTunes, right? Yeah. That same ideology is still in place with Apple Music, where that's why hip hop and rock and some of the more, you know, staple, you know, genres are really great on Apple Music. But then you got Spotify, it's for a more eclectic and diverse palette uh, uh, of a, a user or of a, or of a fan. So when I'm positioning, uh, you know, trying to position a track or a record or something out or a piece yeah, of content. Not to cut I, you off, I, but give me an explanation yeah. of when you say positioning. When you say when I position a record or I position a track, mm -hmm. tell me what you mean from your from your side of, of, of the back end. Well, it's just is I mean it's really just knowing uh, you know where this you know where this song sits on the table uh, in terms of you know how fans engage with you know a certain platform. I know that like I said, fans that have a little bit more of a diverse you know ear. Um, in terms of their willingness to explore different genres, they're going to be on somewhere like Spotify more likely than Apple. Now, this isn't like concrete, but this is just generally speaking. Sure. When I'm working on a Nicole Michelle, you know, record, for, for instance, you know, the way we pitch it in terms of how we're articulating that, you know, it's going to be in a way that caters to the fact that, okay, we know that this artist will do well on this platform. You know, we're not going to go, you know, trying to, you know, get a placement, uh, you know, for an artist, you know, on, you know, Apple that people don't even go to that platform to, you know, consume that music. Um, and again, all of this is the stuff that you can find, you know, it's data and analytics that, you know, you can, you know, just simply look into. But in order to have that data and analytics, you have to have that consistent, like you said, that, that turnover. Yeah. Okay, so and then go it's the only way you get the feedback. It's the only way you get feedback, and you have to do the, do the, do the due diligence on your feedback. Um, you can't, you know, there aren't, you know, organi I mean, there are, you know, there are organizations that can, you know, do some of these analytics for you. But really, you got to put the legwork in yeah. um, you know, as an asset manager and as an artist. Yeah. You know? 
a friend of mine, right? He was he's uh, his name is Anthony Police. He's, he'll be on here probably if he's not already on. But uh, one night he's crashing at my place. He's in NC. He comes up here, and this is when we're putting together some of these web series uh, ideas. And it's like probably three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. He wakes up. He sees me at the screen at the computer screen. I'm like this. He's like, what are you <laughs> doing? I'm like I I'm I'm reading trends. I'm reading you know algorithms. It's like he gets up yeah. and the screen looks like Chinese. You know what I mean? And right. I can barely see as it is. Thank God my, my flex got me a little, uh, you know, a little bifocals or whatever. But yeah. I'm staring and I'm staring. He's like, yo, you are sick, bro. I'm like, look, yeah. if you want to be ahead of this shit, like, this is literally what it takes. Like, you know, I stare it's at some enough. of these friends all night long like a mad scientist. And yeah. if you don't dig into it like that, you're never going to figure out how you can move your own analytics. It's a relationship, man. Like I said, again, I, I keep, I, I've said this so many times, you know, personifying the, the DSPs and the platforms to where, you know, you look at YouTube as almost a person that has a thinking conscious body. You know, when you're, when you're doing, when you're doing tags and SEO and trying to make sure that, you know, on the back end, certain, just like you, you said, the word algorithm, certain, you know, certain keywords and tags ping a certain, you, you know, like yeah. little community, like you mentioned. You know, uh, you have to get you have to get to know these platforms um, in order to um, you know really be able to engage them properly. You know, yeah. SoundCloud, SoundCloud is one as well. It's just like, it's the I've learned so many incredible things about just you know SoundCloud and um, you know its its effectiveness with you know the the younger generation. Yeah, you know, most you know it's just crazy. Yeah. Um, it, to know just and I won't spill all the beans, but you know, one of the things like I didn't know that fifty percent of the users are also creators on SoundCloud. So when you're create so when you're a breaking artist or you're an emerging artist, you know, that's a great platform to be like, hey, let's put this tester out. You know, that's why so many, you know, great artists come, you know, from on the hip hop side, you know, come out of SoundCloud, uh, because that micro community of creators who are also looking to create, who are also looking to go ahead, they're unbiasedly engaged with your music from a creative, you know, standpoint. So they're going to receive your music and your content in a way that, you know, isn't so, uh, you know, super imposed or superficially, you know, filtered into this. Sure. Uh, yeah, you know. So Push, pushed mean, on them or force fed in that sense. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I completely get it. And, you know, you know, we'll, we'll wrap up here in just a few minutes, but yeah, well, you know, what we're, what we're studying, what, you know, guys like me and you start, like, it, you know, it might be nerdy to some people. I love it. Right. And I, and I'm yeah. always like, whenever we're, we're dealing with a new company, maybe they be a promotional company or, you know, just a, an analytical company. I, I want to understand the functionality of how yep. your product works and how it digitally translates into mm -hmm. where, and I'll give you a great example. The other day I was on the phone with Pandora and, you know, through the Naughty by Nature connection, we've been able, able to, to, you know, get a good, a warm relationship with somebody inside of Pandora. And mm -hmm. I, my first question to them was, how do you work with us, but, but also work with our aggregate in that sense? Because we understand you're not going to be paying us directly. So I, I need to understand just how it flows from Pandora into the create system and then to me. And he said, no, absolutely. He's like, you just, what we'll do is you set up with what you want to see from our end, then us knowing first, and this is kind of like how I said when I had the relationship with YouTube, it would yeah. be the same way that then once they understood what we needed from us, then they made that flow through you guys to us. You know what I mean? And, and that's kind of like the same thing that we're, what you guys do is great, man, and, and, and we wouldn't be able to do it without you. And I'm trying to establish to where and we make your job easier as well. You know what I'm saying? And in all yeah. these pushes. But um, it's been quite, you know, the ride so far. And I look right. forward to many, you know, to many more years together, bro. Yeah. So we've been really? killing it so far. Um, yeah, if there's anything that you want to, you know, touch on, if there's any particular subjects that you feel we didn't, we didn't highlight, but... Uh, you know, I, I feel like we really went over a good spectrum of, of how this business works. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, yeah, I think, yeah, we, we got we got into some great stuff, you know. Uh, you know, of course, for me, you know, if you know that was watching, you know, feel free to reach out to, um, you know, via, um, uh, you know, any more 
detailed questions and whatnot. But uh, yeah, I, this is, this has been great, man. I really appreciate you bringing me on for my first IC live ever. That's <laughs> it was dope, a, bro. Maybe one of these days we can go uh, live with with Create, with you know, or even more people at Create. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and yeah. Or something like that. But like you know, the Q, the Q and A side of what I wanted to do, which you know, I, I know we got a little traction here today, which is cool. I appreciate everybody that tuned in. Um, and, you know, I didn't really see many questions come over, so it's not really much to answer. But um, if you had to just pick off the top of your head, I don't mean being to put you on the spot, but like. You know, if there was one question that was asked to you a lot that you would want to clarify, you know, with people in a sense of like, you know, like, like, stop asking me this, man. Like, you should know this by now. Like, like, even if it's down to the 30 day window time, we're trying to, you know, set up a record yeah. for the next month. You know what I mean? Um, but you, at, you know, coming from the actual aggregate, like, like what's something common that you maybe, you know, have some advice for people out there? Uh, with, well, I think the, the most common of course, it is, you know, post-release, the release came out. It's a great record. Why isn't my record on the playlist? Right. You know, uh, and I guess, you know, just replaying back everything that we've been saying. Um, yeah. You know, I think uh, consistency is key, right? Um, and then building a profile that gives us, as the aggregate, leverage to then go and speak with, you know, you know, someone um, on the inside to be like, okay, hey, look, this is Pingy. Yeah. I mean, for years, for years, I was, you know, you know, trying to really master the single, single, single EP, single, single formula to where, you know, I could have some substantial evidence to say like, yo, this formula works. Um, you know, I've been working with, you know, an artist like Grant Ochi, and, you know, Wave IQ, and there's plenty of other artists that create that we've been able to do this with. Um, but now we're really starting to see like, yo, this actually works because, you know, for Wave IQ, he was at 132 monthly listeners, you know, when when we when we, when we first started working with him and now he's at 40,000. And that was over an 18 month period. It was over and, an 18 month and period. That is some great, that's some great raw analytics. And that's, and that's what is- and, and you know, I, thing, The thing about it is, it's crazy because you know, with the work being done during the process, for Grant, they just placed him on the playlist. We didn't even pitch. We pitched, but then post-release, it was way after it came out. He just ends up on an editorial. Yeah, that's you that's. Know, and isn't that the way it happens? Those little, little things that really added up. Uh, you know, just to, to just to show that yo. Work that we're putting in, you know, as a label, as a management company, you know, working with us, uh, working with, you know, other folks like myself uh, over at Create, putting the work in and making sure that the the detail is there, it'll it'll pay, especially if you got number one, which is great records. You know, if you got great records, you just got to put the work in, get a content schedule, plan, and, um, you know, you'll get on those playlists, you know, you'll, you'll get placed. But don't let that be yeah, the... End all be all. Don't, that's that still should not be, you know, the the reason why anyone is doing music. You know, this is about sure. expression. It's about you know. Well, story. you know. Yeah, and 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 obviously playlists have taken over what the traditional radio has been, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and 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 definitely, uh, you know, the last point that I want to make really is that content is currency. All right, so you're dealing with digital content. Mm -hmm. All right, anything that you view, anything that you listen to is content, right? And there's a digital tracking system and number that attaches to every single thing that you watch or listen to. So as a creator, if you're not in the longevity of building that content and, you, and you're looking at it like an asset and building assets every day, every month, then you're, you're really you're in the wrong business. This is about digital asset management and content translating to currency. So with that being the case, man, this is DigiTalks. Sid, I appreciate you. Create Music Group, I really appreciate you. You know, you have me writing the checks every month, so I am very happy. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll touch back again, man. It's been a pleasure. Right. I appreciate it. We'll talk yeah. soon.